I'd like to invite uh, Susan Bloom, uh, Associate Vice President of Applied Research and Innovation with SAS Polytech, to, uh, to introduce our next panel, which we'll be focusing, and I know the title of this one now, which is focusing on technological advancements. So, Susan? Thank you and welcome everyone. And before we get started, I, I just want to send a sincere uh, thank you to both Greg Peltzer and Toddy Steelman for engaging uh, Saskatchewan Polytech on this uh, initiative uh, and to understand and appreciate the um, expertise in applied research and learning that we can bring to the table. Okay, so we'll get started on the session. I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Soka. Uh, who works as a senior scientist in the energy systems team of the VV VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. She holds a PhD in environmental science and policy from the University of Helsinki. Dr. Soka is an expert in climate and environmental impact assessment and LCA of energy products and systems. Her recent work has particularly focused on assessing the sustainable use of renewable energy policy in the Arctic developing recommendations for increased use of renewable energy in the Arctic countries, and assessing the environmental impacts and risks of the Finnish National Renewable Energy Targets. So welcome, and thanks for your long travel. <laughs> I would then like to uh, introduce Raman Hall. Uh, Raman is a senior engineer with the Supply Planning and Integration Division of SAS Power. He received his uh, Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering from the University of Saskatchewan in 2004, yay. <laughs> and uh, his PNG uh, designation from the Association of Professional Engineers of Saskatchewan in 2008. Uh, since graduation, he has and continues to work for the Saskatchewan Provincial Electrical Utility, um, SAS Power Corporation. His areas of expertise include grid transmission systems, generation and load interconnection analysis, transmission reliability assessments, reliability compliance, supply planning, renewables integ integration, and business development. Welcome. Thank you. And I would lastly like to welcome Dr. Michael Ross. Um, Dr. Ross is the NSERC Industrial Research Chair for Colleges in Northern Energy Innovation. Dr. Ross received his bachelor's degree in applied science at the University of Toronto, his master's and PhD in electrical engineering at McGill University, and a postdoc at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. He has collaborated with the NSERT Smart, Grid, uh, Smart Microgrid Network and has also worked at the Hydro-Quebec Research Institute to help upgrade the distribution test line to enable smart grid and microgrid technology. So thank you and welcome. So the way that this session is working is that uh, I have a number of questions for the panelists. So we'll go through these questions and then we'll leave some time at the end so that you can ask the panelists your own questions. Okay. So the first question is, why is renewable energy in northern communities important, and how are northern communities impacted by renewable energy? So Dr. Soka, would you like to start? Yeah. OK. Um, this is on now, isn't it? Yes. OK. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. And, and first of all, I would just like to echo the previous speakers on, on thanking for the excellent, for the very nice opportunity of being here today. And I would like to especially thank Craig Polzer for, for pulling this event together with his colleagues and, and for, like, like Wen said, for his, uh, for his uh, initiative in, uh, in an understanding of how important it is in, of sharing experiences together with among the, the Arctic countries. And I was, would also like to thank all the, all the institutes that have supported the, this event. So, so going, to your, uh, going to your question, uh, in, in Finland, the renewable energy uh, development has been driven mainly by climate change mitigation during the past years, but uh, but also for us as a, as a country, since we don't have our own fossil resources really, except for peat, renewable energy has always also been an important, 
important uh, factor in, uh, in achieving energy security. And, and uh, just to give you some background in, in Finland, we, we have had the EU target of increasing our share of renewable energy to 38% of the total final energy use by 2020, and this, this target was reached a couple of years ago. And the largest share in, in Finland is in, in hydropower, but, uh, no, in wood power, I mean, but hydropower has also been used in, in, in quite a, in, in fairly large percentage, especially in electricity production. But yeah, but for, for, for remote communities, of course, in particular renewable energies, uh, I see it as an important, important uh, factor, important technologies in, in that they, in that they do, do promote your, your uh, energy security, and uh, and they are not so much uh, dependent on on the imports from from other other areas and other countries, as we have heard. But of course, there are also many there are also some technical challenges related to that. But I guess we will go maybe more into those a bit yeah. later. Run. This one's on. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, as well, I'll reiterate some of those same sentiments from everybody on behalf of SAS Power. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come here and, and speak today, uh, and personally for myself to be part of this initiative on the SAS Power benefit is a, a great pleasure. Uh, so as we talk about renewables for Saskatchewan, and, and to reiterate some of Mr. Marsh's comments from this uh, earlier today, uh, we've got goals around emissions reductions and capacity, 50% uh, capacity by 2030 uh, for our renewables. So for northern communities and renewables in general, it, it's a very significant portion of our long-term uh, strategic plan on supply options. Uh, as we look at northern communities uh, specifically, uh, Saskatchewan is unique in the sense that we've actually developed a northern transmission grid for our uh, northern communities uh, to provide that reliability and security for, for those uh, communities in our northern part of our province. Renewables just adds another piece that can help with the reliable um, power supply as well as the sustainability up there uh, for those communities that have a grid connection but also can have customer side uh, supply options that can help benefit uh, them locally. Uh, further on that, renewables just brings a greener alternative supply option into the mix of evaluation. So in communities where primarily uh, a diesel supply is an option or, or is being implemented, renewables coupled in some sense of storage and solar uh, could bring into a, an offset of that fuel consumption that's happening up there. And on the customer side itself, it also brings into a, a, a sustainable business model for them to develop and understand as they look at offsetting their own power consumption costs uh, on the community side too. Thank and thanks, Greg, for putting me on a panel with two doctors as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would just like to echo uh, everyone's Everyone has mentioned the gratitude for University of Saskatchewan for hosting us and inviting us here, as well as uh, uh, Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis for, for hosting this event uh, and allowing us to participate here. Uh, so in terms of what it means for northern communities, uh, it could mean a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean everything for everyone. Uh, it could mean sustainability for some communities that are dependent on the import of fossil fuels. And, Say, for example, in Nunavut, where fuel comes in maybe twice a year, and if there are weather issues or, or the barges don't come in in time, there's a significant dependency on that. So there's local generation that also, that also uh, provides self-reliance in terms of the local generation, and it can match up with the, with the local values, which also brings empowerment and pride. And as Gary mentioned earlier, uh, living next to diesel plants, they're loud. They're noisy, they are, they, it does affect the air quality. And, what, uh, and while renewable technologies aren't, isn't the golden key for everything, it does provide, it is an enabling technology that provides a wide slew of technologies to be implemented to help meet the needs of the northern communities. Thank you. Can you explain in layman's term the types of technologies that can be used in remote communities and how are techno technological innovations evolving to help facilitate community energy in remote communities? Michael, would you like to start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
I guess, well, first of all, I just want to say that, uh, I mean, as far as technologies, we could list them off. There's wind, solar, hydro, energy storage, demand side management. But one thing that's key is that there's no one size fits all. And there's a saying that I like to use that once you've seen one remote community, you've seen one remote community. <laughs> if, if you think about it, like just in the Canadian, I'm just taking the perspective of the Canadian territories, Whitehorse is further west than Victoria, and Iqaluit in Nunavut is further east than Quebec City. To say that it's the same problem all throughout is, is not very applicable. And even, say, for example, Saskatoon, we could, we could all pretty much agree that Saskatoon is pretty far north, but in all things, all things considered, the distance in latitude between Saskatoon and the Arctic Circle is the same as Saskatoon and Sacramento, California. So this is a wide territory, and to say that the problems are the same is, is not applicable. So what we want to do is uh, we want to see what technologies are viable and meets the solutions, identify the solutions, and, and implement the appropriate technologies where applicable. I'm going to piggyback off of some of your answers, Dr. Ross, there, but uh, on the technology side more, uh, renewables is bringing to the, the utility side as well as the customer side uh, plug-and-play technology that makes it more ubiquitous in terms of what applications are being applied. I'll, I'll, I'll ramble off some examples in terms of solar shingles, solar paint, solar film, solar windows. Obviously, I'm focusing on the solar a little bit, um, but other technology advancements are happening in other excuse me, and other technologies as well in terms of wind and geothermal um, and, and biomass as well. So they're bringing uh, a gambit of applications that are available for remote communities where the labor force may not be as skilled, a more modular design is easier to access and maintain, but it also, to, to Dr. Ross's comment, um, every remote community can be different and there is no one size that fits all at all. Sorry. Yes, so to continue on that, I totally agree with, uh, with Raman and, and Michael on that, that there definitely isn't one, one solution for the, for the energy, energy issues, and, and this definitely applies both to remote communities as to the nation as a whole. But like, like Michael said, there are, there are several technologies available that can be used in the, in the remote communities, and in, uh, in Finland, our our focus has been on, on wood-based energy and on, on the, the wood energy has traditionally been combined with pulp and paper production and there is a, we have a lot, of, a lot of knowledge on combined heat and power production that's also used in, in fairly small communities and it's, it's usually combined with pulp and paper mills or, or with, some other, with some other industrial units. And, uh, and also, ground source heat pumps have been fairly, fairly popular during the, during the past years. What is maybe different in, in Finland and in the Nordic countries compared to, uh, to the North America is like we, like we saw in this uh, really impressive map that, uh, that Gwen showed us uh, during the previous panel is that, uh, that in the Nordic countries, the, the electric grid practically extends everywhere, so we don't have any any microcrits in in that sense, so it's a so it's a very different solution. Uh, there are different solutions chosen in in our countries, and this uh, there are of course political reasons to that, but uh, but also the distances are just so much so much longer here in uh, in Canada and, and in Alaska. Yeah, but this is thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are the main challenges for renewable energy in your region, and how can they be overcome? Raman, we'll let you start this one off. I was wondering, wondering if you're going to make me go in the middle. So. <laughs> um, uh, main challenges with renewables is the variability, uh, and, and that's known on the operating and the planning side on how you manage um, a resource that you can't control. Uh, with a gas turbine, it's easy enough to turn it up, turn it down, follow the load how you need to, um, but you can't, you can forecast, but you can't manage when the sun shines or when the wind blows. So the variability is the main challenge, especially when you're talking about remote communities where there's potential for islanding and if you want to continue to maintain uh, that load and, and, su and supply power within that microgrid or that islanded scenario. So variability would be my, my comment on that. 
Laura, would you like to comment uh, next? Yes, I would like to uh, follow up on that. That's definitely one. That's the aspect that's usually taken up in in uh, in my country concerning this as well. And what is what is now talked about a lot in in Finland and especially in in VTT, where in the research institute I work in other so-called power to X concepts where, where solar or wind energy would be used to, to produce, produce uh, for example, methanol or, or hydrogen out of, the, out of, out of uh, CO2 or, and water. So these are, these are kind of concepts that, that maybe could be, could be used in the future to, uh, as one solution to, to store energy. And of course we are, like was mentioned earlier today as well, we are, we are developing methods to, to predict the, the production of, of solar and wind power. So, so uh, like this, uh, there are now methods to, to predict the production for about 36 hours ahead, but of course, of course backup power is, is needed. And, uh, and there, of course, we will be needing other, other solutions as well. And wood, wood is, of course, one good, good solution in this, in this sense. But this is maybe, at least in my country, this is an issue that has often maybe even been exaggerated in relation to, to this. And it's, uh, it's only now during the, the past couple of years that solar power has, has only really started to, to grow in, in importance or uh, and has been, has been taken up in the in the public discussions, and it's actually, it has maybe even grown from, from the ground really that it wasn't really considered in the public policy making, but but people just started installing solar panels because they were getting they were getting so cheap, and people were seeing that it's actually actually worth it, and now it's it's starting to be understood as a real solution maybe in the in the Arctic regions regions as well. Michael? Um, okay, so please bear with me. We were given these questions in advance, so I've made a little bit of a list. <laughs> um, and, and by no means is this all encompassing, but I've kind of broken it down into several issues that, that may arise. Uh, the first one is economy. I mean, that's, that's kind of the elephant in the room. Like, the, because every solution is very different, there is no economy of scale, and there's very high capital costs. I mean, you could throw money at a solution, but in terms of how much it's actually, in terms of the business plan and everything, there's a high risk if you want to leverage against, uh, say, uh, go to the banks and get a loan or anything. There's a high risk involved, and, and the economy, uh, the economics of the project is, is a high barrier for these remote communities. Uh, the second is also is logistics. Uh, how, for example, we saw the, the crane come in uh, on the island, but if you have a, if you don't have a barge, if you do, if you're a flying community, how can you get a crane in there? How can you put up towers? And also, uh, with in in terms of melting permafrost, how do you ensure that the foundations maintain their their structural stability in changing climates? Uh, and not only changing climates, but in harsh climates. Say, for example, if you want to implement storage, I mean, sure, energy storage systems. Uh, you could enclose them in an encasing and regulate the temperature and the environment for that storage system, but that just reduces the efficiency of the battery systems. Uh, so that so you have to look at the technologies as well in terms of the logistics of implementing them in the remote communities. Uh, the next is technology. Again, going back to the economies of scale, wind turbine manufacturers are predominantly looking at megawatt scale wind turbines, which is not a viable solution on a community of say. Uh, 500 megawatt peak or 500 kilowatt peak or below. Uh, so that there's a technology gap there. And for example, in, uh, in uh, the Kwani First Nations up in Yukon, they're looking at refurbish refurbished wind turbines from when the manufacturers were making kilowatt scale wind turbines and tilt up towers so they don't need cranes. So they're looking at those solutions like that, uh, as well as uh, uh, resiliency and maturity of technology. So the North isn't a place to test up and coming uh, equipment and technologies. You don't test it in harsh climates first and harsh conditions first. You test it and verify that it works under normal operating conditions before you send it off into extreme operating conditions. So that is another, so the North does not want to be a test ground for, uh, uh, for up and coming technologies. But that being said, 
necessity is the mother of, of innovation. And so there may be viable solutions and business cases in the north that might not be applicable down south. Uh, the next one, which has been mentioned before, is human capacity. So the knowledge of available solutions. You may not, remote community, community members might not know what solutions are available to them, but also in terms of once, once installation has been done, the ongoing operation and maintenance support. Uh, and finally, there's the regulatory issue in terms of reliability, uh, reliability of supply. As, as Raman mentioned, there's a lot of variability in intermittent resources, and it's the utility's mandate to provide safe and reliable power to the customers. And so the higher amount of renewables that are being implemented in the system, the more volatility there is in the system and the less the utility is capable of, of, of maintaining that mandate. Uh, so we need to move forward in a more responsible manner. And I mean, again, talking about the elephant in the room, a lot of people aren't talking about the benefits of diesel. And I'm not saying that, that diesel is the best solution, but it is controllable. It is, it, it is dispatchable. And so if we are going to come up with a better solution, we have to acknowledge what we're reducing our reliance on so that we could supplement them with a supplemental technology. Say, for example, if storage could provide that reliability, that may be a viable solution moving forward. Thank you. Um, each of your regions are understandably different. Uh, infrastructure, politics, regulations, culture. Um, however, what do you think are some lessons in spite of these differences? In other words, how can the Yukon and other Canadian regions and Finland learn from each other? Laura, please. Um, well, I already brought up the microgrids, and I think that that's one, that's one issue where we definitely have some, some learning and, and that could maybe be applied also in, in some instances in, in the Nordic countries. And uh, yeah, and also, the, also the, the own in initiative of the communities that was mentioned earlier, earlier today and ha that has been characteristic for Alaska. I think that's something that, that is definitely something for the, for the Nordic countries to, to learn from. And at least in, in Finland, as we are very kind of publicly <laughs> steered country where we are expecting the, the government to, to organize things for us, this is something that's, that's maybe often, often not, really, not really considered so much. The communities are, are not so active in, in themselves. And, and that's definitely something that could be could be learned. And uh, uh, well, this is not a very familiar issue to me, but I think that in, at least in Canada, there are these public-private partnership models that, that have worked very well and that could work, work in a, 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 where we could learn from as well. And, uh, and the solar energy development in, in Canada, for example, you are further in that than we are. And what just occurred to me was that as, uh, as you mentioned, uh, wind power as a, as, a, as a solution to the problems that people find in, in diesel generators. And, and in, in Finland, wind power has been, oppo there has been a lot of opposition against wind power because it's considered so noisy and, and then there has now even been talk about these ultrasounds that would cause all kinds of health problems and even though there have been studies on that and nothing has been found, it's still, still considered a big problem and, and that has really been a slowdown for the, for the spreading of, of windmills, that, uh, that there are so many complaints on them and then that always takes quite a long time before it's, it's gone through. So I guess there's also, there would probably be some learning in, in how to introduce new initiatives to the, to the public. Michael? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been mentioned. Uh, I think we need to share knowledge and learn from each other. Uh, there, I, I, one thing that I like to see is like, uh, I mean, the panel from, from before in Alaska, uh, I would even say that they're about 10 to 15 years ahead of where we are in the Canadian territories and we could learn from the lessons that they've done. Uh, Gwyn had mentioned several examples as well. And, and one example that I like to think, like in, in St. Paul Island, uh, they, they have a type one wind turbine and they manage their, just the turbine, and they manage their voltage regulation with a synchronous condenser and their frequency regulation with controllable loads. I had never seen this anywhere else. And is that solution applicable everywhere? No. But 
by knowing what has been implemented and taking the lessons learned, there's no point in making the same mistakes twice. We could break it down and identify what are the challenges, what are the solution, what are the challenges in, that each community had to face and disseminate that throughout the north because there may not be geothermal everywhere, there may not be, uh, there might not even be wood available everywhere. The Nunavut, it's, it's, above the arc, it's above the tree line. But identifying what the solutions are and then seeing what, tech, what solutions and what technologies enable the solution of those challenges, we could help disseminate that and then, and, uh, and like I said, not repeat the same mistake twice. Great. Robin? Lessons learned, increased collaboration, and, and potential partnerships were the three I was going to focus on, and, and both my colleagues here have said that. And uh, just learning from each other uh, is the key, and we're doing that within SAS Power now, looking out in, in North America and finding out how it was performed in Ontario, California, other jurisdictions, and just learning before we implement such technologies within Saskatchewan. Um, and, and as I sit here with two doctors beside me, I'm trying to read their notes because that's exactly what I'm trying to get is an increased collaboration <laughs> and understanding from both of them. So um, that, that's what uh, we, we pride ourselves within SAS Power is uh, looking at, researching, and, and partnering with others to understand uh, how the best application within Saskatchewan can occur. Thank you. How do you see the future of renewable energy in northern communities? Michael, we'll start with you. Um, I honestly say that, I, I would say that it plays a part in the big picture, and it plays a bit part where, part where applicable. I think we need to identify why we're going with renewables. If it's to reduce diesel, the, most, the, the, the low hanging fruit is conservation. If it's to reduce diesel but maintain a growing economy, maybe it's efficiency. Where there, and then maybe the last step is renewables. But I mean, not to say that renewables can't play a part in this, but we need to identify the solution or identify the issues and why we're going about doing this. Uh, and in terms of the way I see us disseminating renewable energy technologies, uh, uh, getting off diesel, uh, the first thing that I'd say that we need to do is we need to go to the communities and we need to listen. I mean, every single person in this, I can guarantee every single person in this room knows at least one thing that I don't know. And I guarantee that every single student at University of Saskatchewan knows at least one thing that I don't know. Now imagine going to a community that will be benefiting from the, from the technologies and going to the community and learning what it is their way of life, what, what, what are their values and how they use their energy. So in terms of learning what the energy usage is and a community energy plan is a fantastic way of doing this. So we can't get from point A to point B if we don't know what point A is. So we need to, we need to do that. And as Gwen mentioned before, uh, we need to build local capacity. So having community champions, that's, some, that's, a, that's a term that I learned when moving up to Whitehorse is that community champions is, is key because if something goes wrong, say for example in Nunavut, if a, if, if a, a power system goes down, you have to fly technicians into the system, which may take a day or two, and that's if landing conditions are perfect. So imagine 40 below, and you'd have to have perfect conditions to fly the technicians there, or you don't have power. Um, but ultimately, I just want to say, it's, it's, I, want to I want to make sure that we understand the challenges, and I think that it's important that we address them collaboratively in a socially responsible, uh, environmentally friendly, and economically viable manner. Thank you. Raman? Uh, renewables in general is at the forefront of everything that we're talking about at the utility. So I, I feel it as a community, as a icebreaker with communities in the north to talk about energy efficiency, talk about new generation options, uh, as well as alternatives to what we're thinking about for the conventional power utility. So for us, with our northern system, um, we have a, a transmission system up there. Renewables becomes a customer side solution that could be an alternative to new transmission or transmission upgrades. Uh, and then within the community, it becomes uh, potential for business models, for the human capacity or human capital comment of developing those aspects as well. So I, I see it as a great way to start the conversation on uh, potential for new developments within, within northern and remote communities. Thank you. Laura? 
Uh, well, being a, working with climate change mitigation, I, uh, I, and, and being at least, <laughs> at least in this sense, an, an optimist, I, I hope to see uh, renewable energy having a having a very big share in our energy energy mix in the in the future. And as we know, that if we want to at least at least stay stay below two degrees, which uh, in the global average temperature, which already might be might be an impossible target. We will uh, we will definitely need renewable or or anyway energy sources that that don't produce CO2 emissions to have a have a huge share in our in our energy mix. But of course, that being said, the the Arctic region and the and the countries in the north, and especially areas like, like you mentioned, Nunavut, they have a very small share of the total, total CO2 emissions. So, so of course, in these regions, there, there definitely may be cases where, where fossil, fossil energy sources have a, are, are very well defendable, like, like diesel, for example. But. Uh, yeah, but uh, and and when developing renewable energy, I think it's uh, it is really important to, like was mentioned here, to develop them together, uh, develop them together with the communities, and in order to to avoid the mistakes that have been have been made in the past. And for example, with hydropower development, we know also from the Nordic countries that there are there are uh, there are examples of uh, of situations where the where the communities have definitely not been considered in the in the development, or or like is happening even now in Finland with the, with cutting down of forests in the in Lapland, for example. So, so so these are yeah, like has been said, there are not one solution for for everyone, and and definitely there will be a place for fossil energy sources at least in some some amount in the in the north in the future as, as well. Okay, thank you. So we're just gonna get a little bit more detailed questions now. Um, how will the increase of renewable energy impact the electricity grid? And what are the key impacts of renewable energy on the electrical grid? Raman, would you like to start? Problem. Um, for, for us with SAS Power, we've got our goals of 50% uh, renewables by 2030. So we're just on the beginning of that and the leading edge of implementing that within our supply plan. So right now we're actually undertaking a renewables integration study where we're looking at the impacts on the electrical grid and understanding it in a proactive nature such that when it comes time to actually Im implement those larger penetrations of megawatts on our system, we understand what it means from an operational perspective and we are able to actually implement in advance uh, what needs to be done uh, from an operational sense. So the variability, um, the forecasting uh, increases, uh, all of those technical aspects are what we're trying to figure out now before we jump feet first into the renewables pool, essentially. Thank you. Laura? Um, well, this is not my, I'm not an engineer. I think that this is something that, that Raman, for example, knows, knows a lot better. But, uh, but yeah, like he, like he said, that uh, flexible, I mean, the, well, flexible production, this is what, what would be characteristic for a system based on renewable energy is, is flexible, that it's flexible, it's, uh, it's variable. So we need, uh, that, that definitely poses challenges on the, on the grid and, uh, and it needs to be considered. There's a lot of development going on related to this, uh, this at the moment all, all over the world, I know. And, uh, and there are, these are issues that can be can be solved, of course, when thinking about uh, production that's not, uh, that doesn't produce CO2 emissions, of course, in, in the Nordic countries, well, in Finland, uh, nuclear power is, of course, considered now at the, at the moment, and we are even building new power plants, that's, uh, but uh, when thinking about renewable energy, wood-based wood uh, energy definitely has a, has its role in in this, and this is something where we, where Finland can, and the Nordic countries can also provide a lot of expertise on. But uh, but on how it actually technically <laughs> influences the grid, I'm not the best person to ask. Thank you, uh, Michael. 
Uh, I would say that renewables would affect the grid much in the same way that Raman was saying in terms of reliability, uh, reserve provision, ancillary service support, uh, and even in terms of the planning, the stochastic uh, dispatch planning of the system, uh, as I had mentioned before, there's no solution that that's covers everything. Even to say that 20% is the limit of penetration of renewable penetration into systems is a blanket statement. And utilities in the north understand that. They, they are still going with the 20% because that's the best information that they have. And that's some of the research that uh, uh, myself and my colleagues at the Yukon Research Center are pursuing. We're, we're modeling electric power systems and performing a grid impact study that is pertinent to each community. Once you model it within the specific platform, you could, you could look at site dynamic stability, small signal stability, energy balance, protection coordination, uh, many different uh, resonance phenomena, uh, harmonics, and see what are the actual impacts of integrating renewable resources technology and keeping the system as is, how much the system could host in a responsible manner because what well, utilities are, are I haven't spoken with a single utility that isn't on board with implementing renewables, but it must be moved forward in a responsible manner. Thank you. Um, how will the regulatory framework have to change to accommodate an increase in renewable energy? Uh, Laura, we'll start with you. Um, well, in, um, in, the case of, uh, in the case of my country, I, I think that the, the regulatory system already is fairly accommodating as it, as, it comes to, as it comes to renewables. Of course, in order to, the, the electricity is, is still fairly, fairly cheap in Finland, so there, there of course, could be, could be a, a ways to, uh, initiatives put there in, uh, in order to, to maybe uh, provide more encouragement for, for increasing the share of of renewables, but in in general, we have a fairly fairly <laughs> our our system is uh, is already we have a very high targets for renewables already as it as it is now, and uh, so in uh, so in that sense, it's and there have also been production supports for the for for wind power and and for solar power. So it's yeah. Thank you. For us with SAS Power, we have our goals already established around renewables. Uh, the policy frameworks are evolving as we develop more. Um, I'll tie it back to our renewables integration study. We want to be prudent on what we're doing, so understanding it before we actually implement it. And then other governmental agencies within Saskatchewan are coming out with such things as siting guidelines to help out on the environmental side, as well as other policy frameworks will just enable it. So we're, we're in a good stance within Saskatchewan to, to facilitate the renewables, um, but we are being prudent in terms of understanding it before we, we dive completely in. Michael? Uh, as far as the regulatory aspect is concerned, I mean, I want to make, we want to make sure that it meets the community values. So we want to understand why the regulations are in place. Like say, for example, from a policy standpoint, uh, if, there are, if there are diesel subsidies for remote communities just because electricity is expensive in these remote communities, if you get off diesel, you get off the subsidies. So is that a viable structure for, for the community or what are we actually subsidizing in that case? Um, and, and as far as the regulatory from the utilities perspective, uh, I mean, everything is, is, you could think of it as a, almost like a multi-objective optimization where you have, where you're balancing solutions that have a strict constraint of meeting reliable, safe and reliable power, but you're balancing the social, economic, and environmental aspects of them. So the regulatory thing could help put, even though, even if renewables aren't necessarily economically viable in the, in the present term. Uh, as technology evolves, or even energy storage, as technology evolves, there may be incent incentives to value more the social aspect or the environmental aspect to help push in that direction so that they can be comp cost competitive with other sources. Thank you. Um, we'll let you start on this one again, Michael. Um, how will a carbon price impact the trajectory of renewable energy? And is the success of the renewable energy industry contingent on having these pricing mechanisms in place? Um, I would say that uh, it will have an impact, and as I'd mentioned in the example before, it's, it all depends on how the policy is implemented. Uh, I don't have a solution, in there, and, and I, I'm, I'm not a policy person, so I, I don't really know which, which is better, but by, have, by making other fossil fuel-based generation 
more costly, it makes other renewables more cost competitive or other technolog technological solutions more cost competitive that could push the renewable technology over the edge of being of lining up with social and environmental goals that it could be the solution that communities would be going towards versus uh, going towards fossil fuel based generation. Thank you. Can I have no comment on that? <laughs> Within SAS Power, we're looking at options, we're evaluating uh, how it could play out, uh, and we're, but more so we're looking at other jurisdictions and how they are looking and, and implementing their carbon tax. Uh, Ontario is an example of where they've taken it back and they've implemented a green on program where they've pushed it back into the renewable sector. So there's options around that. Um, but within S S S SAS Power, we're still evaluating options around it. Okay, and Laura? Uh, as you probably know, Finland is part of the EU emission trading, trading scheme. And, and we also have, a, have a taxes based on, on CO2 emissions on, on the, on, uh, on, tra on fuels, on petrol and, and diesel used in, in traffic. But, uh, but regarding the emission trading system, it's, it, there it's actually has been a bit problematic that the renewable energy sources are supported within the, within the emission trading sector. So, so for example, wind power has been, has been supported in the in electric, electricity production, and that only leads to bringing down the, basically it leads to bringing down the, the carbon price, which has been, has been very low altogether now, now during the, during the past years. And, and this then only, it acts as an indirect uh, sub, uh, subsidy to, to coal production, really. So, so there one definitely needs to be careful. I'm, I'm not a policy person either, but not to, not to put in place this this mixed mixed uh, mixed uh, what are they called mechanisms on on uh, on supporting something that's actually already would be would be supported by the uh, by the emission trading trading scheme and maybe maybe one problem there also has been that I would think that the as the emission Emission price is so low, it's an indication of that there could be even more potential for emission reduction on, on, on CO2 reduction on, on those sectors that are, that are part, of the, part of the emission trading program. But I, I don't know how well you know about the system, but at the moment only, only part of the emissions are part of the emission trading scheme, and then the rest like, like, uh, like, uh, like traffic and and, and, uh, and housing and, and things like that are, are outside the system. And, and there we have quite high targets for, for emission reduction. And there it's then more expensive to maybe to use the renewables. So, so there are, this is a complicated, complicated system. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to now open it up to the audience. If you have any questions you would like to uh, ask our panel members, and just a reminder, just to come up to the uh, microphone so we can have that recorded. And again, if you could just uh, state your name and sure. um, what organization you're with for all of us. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I'm Andrew Watson. I'm uh, uh, with the uh, University of Saskatchewan. And I was wondering uh, whether the panelists might be able to speak to the applicability of uh, renewable energy sources for northern communities in the context of specific end uses. So uh, transportation versus heating versus supplying electricity for lighting and uh, versus growing food uh, versus other industrial uh, applications. So how do you see renewables uh, fitting into a lot of those end use uh, outcomes? Uh, so in the north, uh, there's actually, so at the Yukon Research Center, there's a division that, at, that kind of parallels with what we're doing in terms of economic development. Uh, and they have three main pillars. Uh, one is cold climate housing. Uh, the other is food security. And then the third is energy in terms of, as you say, renewables. Uh, and, and we can look at energy not just from an electrical standpoint, but from a heating standpoint, because heat is a big energy resource from the system and looking at 
I mean, even looking at making diesel systems more efficient with combined heat and power may be a viable option where we're looking at more efficient solutions in that. And I was surprised with how, how big greenhouses are in the north. Uh, if you look at Guinness Book of World Records of the biggest vegetables, they often come from Alaska because the sun is there all the time. You put greenhouses there and it, it's, it's, it's a fantastic resource. Now, that being said, the converse is also true in terms of the winter, there is no sun. And so that's why food security and cold climate housing and everything is also very, very important. And, and it is, renewable technology is a piece of the puzzle. There isn't, there isn't one problem with the blatant solution. It, it's, all, it's all mixed and, and sorry, I don't have anything more specific than that, but uh, uh, I could give you some examples if you'd like. So, so for example, uh, Tesla is looking at biomass. Tesla community in, in the Yukon is looking at biomass up in Old Crow, the only flying community in the Yukon above, and also above the Arctic Circle. They want to implement a high penetration of solar on their system, and they're working with, they're working uh, as an independent power producer, but they're working in partnership with the local utility, Atco Electric, on how they could facilitate that without compromising reliability so that they don't have to, ha so that they won't have any issues if the power goes out. Uh, Kluwani First Nations out in Burwash Landing, Destruction Bay are implementing uh, a wide slew of, of technologies in terms of they're looking at high penetration wind on their system. They already have 50 kilowatts of solar and they've even investigated geothermal on their systems. They've got, I think it's 17 or 19 degree water, which isn't enough for generation. It's, it's uh, not like the Chena Hot Springs, uh, but uh, uh, which is actually, actually I highly recommend that you look that up because it's fantastic technology. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, the, there's, there's a whole, it, it's just a piece of the puzzle is what I'd say. I think that's good. Okay, good. Uh, I would maybe like to add the, uh, about the transportation, whether, well, you, you briefly mentioned maybe biofuels as well, but that's, uh, that's something that's being developed a lot in the, especially in Finland, and we even have a target of 30% of, of biofuels of the of the total uh, fuel use in uh, or energy use in the transportation sector so so that is of course something that that fits some of the some of the arctic countries as well but but obviously there's now a lot of critical discussion over whether whether that actually brings uh, climate benefits but it's uh, it is something that that uh, if you if you just want to re increase the share of renewables, then that's uh, that's definitely one one solution. And uh, and like you mentioned, combined heat and heat and power production. I I keep bringing up wood as it's so important in my in my own country. But uh, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of wood-based systems that produce uh, that on uh, producing combined heat and heat and power. And like you. Like Michael said as well, heating is a is a really big energy source in the in the north, or energy demand source in the north. The, the panel this afternoon on the business case for renewables would be a good one to ask them a little bit more about too. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Next question. Thank you, Kevin Hudson with Saskatoon Light and Power. Um, with uh, the integration of renewables and uh, these types of variable distributed generation sources. Um, a, a smart grid uh, is, is likely to be, play a, a vital role um, controlling energy flowing on and off the grid. And so um, the question could be for any one of the panelists, but what role do you see a future smart grid playing in a, within a microgrid or in the case of northern Saskatchewan with an interconnected northern grid? S smart grid and... Uh implementation of distributed energy resources go hand in hand. You, you won't be able to have any of those DER uh, type technologies implemented uh, effectively for the utility or for the customer side without a smarter grid. So that's, SAS Power is looking into how to upgrade and, and revitalize our, our distribution system to essentially accommodate two-way power flow uh, on that network. So they go hand in hand completely. Uh, I like to think of the smart grid as, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I, I, I mean, smart grid is a ubiquitous term, but I, I don't like to use it because the existing power infrastructure is inherently smart. It's a passive system that works, but it's designed around, as, as Raman mentioned, like downflow and energy, downstream energy flow with rotating machinery. But what smart grids or active, 
Active Grids enable is, is observation and control of the system. So you can do two-way power control. You can do, say, uh, dynamic protection coordination uh, if there is, di the is two-way power stream. And you're able to optimize the system a lot better. Now, with added complexity, you, you can have other issues. But it, does, it definitely holds the potential to facilitate the integration of these technologies, for sure. Thank you. Next question. Yes, uh, Mark Bicklin Pritchard, Low Energy Design Limited. Um, I think this one's probably mostly for Laura, but others um, may have things to say about it. Uh, clearly, one of the things that we need to be working on is dispatchable renewables. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what experience there is, especially in, in the Nordic countries, in terms of uh, biosyngas um, operation in very cold climates. You know, it's been shown to work in places like Germany and Britain, it's been shown to work uh, further south as well, but what experience do you have in Scandinavia? I must, uh, I must say that I'm, uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not so familiar with that that I, I could answer you, but I can actually provide you some contact details to some, uh, some colleagues of mine who, who work with that and, uh, and know, uh, know a lot on that. Okay, so, connect later. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Sorry, I, I don't have, no. we don't have that much experience with, uh, with Syngas. Uh, I mean, it is a topic to investigate, but, but there isn't a lot of experience up in the territories. Uh, and as you mentioned, with controllability of renewables, uh, you could think of controllability as powering it has to equal power out. If you don't, another solution, another viable solution that we haven't talked about is, say, if you need to have power balance, and you can't control the generation, maybe you could control the load. Uh, the Shininik Wind Group in Alaska, they, they have about 200% wind penetration, and when the wind goes up, they store that energy in electric thermal storage. And they are able to do that because instead of it being a utility whose jurisdiction ends at the meter, it's a co-op. So the, so, the, so the community members do have part ownership of the utility, and so they do have beyond the meter uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, and there are many, many, many different ways of doing demand side management. Uh, one of my favorite, because it's, I mean, it's very low tech, is Hydro Quebec. They buy out new, the front pages of newspapers and radio ads and TV ads and say, hey, we're going to have a peak at this point. We'd like you to reduce your consumption and delay doing your washing machine, delay doing your dishwasher. And they're able to curtail five gigawatts of power at peak power. So, I mean, there are, there are a whole bunch of solutions. Uh, it's just a matter of finding it which, which is applicable. And as far as controllability of renewables, there's a maximum that it could produce based on available sun or wind or whatever resources available, and you could always curtail that. But, the, but that maximum is dictated by the environment in which it's operating. Thank you. Robin? I was just going to add quickly in terms of technology advancements, uh, wind turbines. There's starting to be a research trend around dispatchability of wind turbines and actually having some load following capability. It's, it's starting to just be newly emerging, but uh, there's potential there in terms of something we've thought that we couldn't control at all and actually having a control band around the uh, output of that unit. Thank you. Judy Kel Mukumi, GM uh, Academic Plus. Uh, we spoke about the human capacity has a limitation in the development of the implementation of some of the technologies. And one of the things that we know about Northern communities that they are used to their surroundings. So they know better than anyone else, for example, the forest. And forest could be, as woody biomass, a source of energy. Is it something that is implementing that is possible to implement here in Saskatchewan and is there anything already in place and what Finland is doing I would like to know a little bit more about your feedstock your production of biomass how do you do that uh, well first of all about uh, how the how the biomass is is used in Finland in in Finland uh, about half of it is is used to, uh, uh, originates from the pulp and paper production. So it's either either comes from the through the black liquor that's produced during uh, during pulp making, or then it it comes from the forest residues that are that are created while while cutting the 
while cutting the wood, either in the, either in these, what are they called? But in the places that, that cut the, cut the wood, from the pulp and paper facilities practically. Okay. But then also the, the forest residues that are left in the, in the forests are, are being used. And now it's becoming more and more common to, to cut the, like the small diameter wood and to, and to use it. And, uh, and a lot of it is used in, uh, well, most of it is used in, uh, yeah, either, either in, uh, in combined heat and power production or in, in, uh, in heat production. And then now, now also these, uh, these biofuel, biofuel plants are, are coming. But, uh, but yeah, then concerning the, the role of the communities in, in that, I think that's uh, definitely a, a very important issue, and, and that's something that, at least in Finland and probably in Sweden and Norway as well, there's a lot of competing demands posed on the, on the forests now, now at the moment, and, and we want to produce energy out of it, we want to use it for pulp and paper making, but then on the other hand, for example, in the north, it's of course traditionally the lands have belonged to the to the local communities and, and they are using them for, for example, for reindeer herding. So there's, these are issues that are, are, are debated a lot in, in Finland and, and in other European countries maybe now at the moment as well and, and there aren't really, really any easy solutions for that but I, I definitely think that the, that the communities should be involved in the, in the decision making. So just, just to tie on with applicability for Saskatchewan, there are biomass projects that have been proposed and are being evaluated. So the potential is here uh, from the SAS power side, we look at the sustainable option offering on it and that includes the sustainability of the fuel source, the operation, the maintenance, all, the all-in <coughs> costs essentially. So just to simply put, they are being evaluated within Saskatchewan. And I had mentioned uh, before about uh, community of tests on implementing Hargasner units for, uh, 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 for, for biomass, and they're looking at it specifically for heating, but they're also going to put Coal Climate Innovation is involved with that project, also looking at combined heat and power to see whether or not they could produce electricity from it. Uh, and Coal, Coal Climate Innovation, and, as well as Yukon Research Center, with partnership with, from University of Alberta, they're also investigating uh, fast growth willows for biomass up in Old Crow, with the, the flying community up in, in uh, in the Yukon. Thank you. So we'll um, just have one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, Kevin Wilson with uh, Onic Engineering Consulting. Well, I, I'm wondering if you could tell us maybe, Ramon, specifically with regards to battery energy storage systems at a grid level. When we talk about dispatchable energy and we talk about islanding, is there, is there any movement towards um, looking at, at a community level, not so much a co-op level, but a community level behind the meter, grid level battery energy storage coupled with PV, solar, wind, hydro. You're speaking my language, I love it. <laughs> um, the, the, the nuances with the battery storage is the costs continue to decline, so there is a little bit of a waiting game to see where those costs will, how low they will go essentially. Um, but hybrid solutions that you just mentioned behind the meter are, are totally on SAS Power's radar, and we're looking at how those can be a, a potential partnership between the utility and the community, as well as just the operational nature and how it'll interact. Um, the buzzwords around microgrids, islanding, all of those are being evaluated within, uh, within our renewables portfolio to see how we can play in, into this market and collaborate into this market as well. It's one of the other aspects that we're looking outside of Saskatchewan to see how it's being implemented uh, elsewhere, pardon me, and um, partnering with others that are on the panel and, and other jurisdictions is where we could get that information, get that data, and understand it better so that we can implement it correctly in Saskatchewan. The reason I ask that is, is I think that there's, um, there's a technical component of the reduction in the levelized cost of energy for battery energy storage. Um, whether you're using you know, lithium polymer or vanadium reflux or whatever type of battery energy or even the larger ones where they're using with compressed air and, and pumped hydro. I'm interested more in the regulatory issue. Is there, 
the stomach with the regulatory agencies such as has power to actually island large communities, whether it's in neighborhoods or in First Nations, or to actually say, look, at, instead of you know sending a meter to every little community from SAS Power, have a meter at the tie-in and then have the community actually save its money. Because as you know, when you reverse meter energy back into the grid, um, you're not getting the most. You're paying your transmission, distribution yep. costs, frequency modulation, voltage modulation, all of that dispatch issue going back in. And I'm just wondering, what is the direction from a regulatory point of view within SAS power of moving towards encouraging islandings should the, you know, the battery energy cost come down? The, it's still a topic that we have to research extensively because, as we mentioned, uh, in terms of how the distribution system is set up right now, one-way power flow is the way it's set up, and islanding scenarios are typically not permitted because there's no control aspect in there. Battery storage, uh, distributed energy resources, bring that opportunity to the table. Mm -hmm. But for Saskatchewan to understand how to operate effectively and safely within that island, that's something that we're still trying to evolve and, and understand. Right now we have um, a centralized generation model where we have our generation at large power plants, send it on the transmission down to the distribution system. The, the shift in mindset to a potential decentralized uh, generation model is what we're looking into as part of our renewables integration study and as part of all the work we're doing with renewables in general. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion today. <laughs>